Well, we welcome you again to another Praying Through the Psalms. And the psalm that we've selected for today was very, very important to the early church. As a matter of fact, when the first big persecution started to break out against the church, they prayed this psalm. And so we want to pray this psalm also. And we'll show you the results that they had from that prayer. And we're going to trust God that we have those kind of results too. But Psalm chapter 2 is where we're at today. So if you'd find Ch Psalm chapter 2, I'm going to ask Wayne to read it. And then we'll worship the Lord and start praying our way through Psalm number 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your procession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is king little but a little, blessed are those who put their trust in the Lord. Amen. Lord, Amen. we just ask you to open your word today, that we would pray with your kind of authority and your kind of power as a result. And we bless you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. an awesome God. Well, I've divided this psalm up, and I think it's a natural breakdown within the psalm itself, into four sections. And here's the first one, verses 1 through 3, is simply what I'm calling the nation's rage. It starts with a question, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? It talks about the kings of the earth rallying themselves together, making this uh, this noisome tumult. Uh, they're taking counsel together. But notice it says at the end of verse 2, it is against the Lord and against His anointed. In other words, it is against God and it is against Jesus Christ. I think historically it is also against Israel, which was also the chosen of the Lord, and, and the nations of the world have always opposed Israel. But here's why. Look at verse 3. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Now the Bible does say in Revelation 20 verse 3 that Satan deceives the nations. And you know he hates the counsel of God and the people of God and the things of God. And he, he deceives the nations. And, and you read the book of Revelation and there's a recurring theme of the nations and the people is represented by beasts rising up against God and against his people. And we see that several times in Revelation 17, 14. Uh, they're going to make war on the Lamb, but the Lamb's going to overcome them. In, in chapter 19, 19, they're, they're like armies opposing God, but they're eventually dealt with and cast into the lake of fire. So we see throughout the scripture that there's this ongoing thing of the nations rising up and opposing God and his anointed and his people. 
Why is that? Well, I think the answer is found in a parable of Jesus in Luke chapter 19, verse 14, where Jesus tells this parable about giving out some aminas for people to make more money, and, and then he sends his son back. But the, here's the quote. When the son comes back, the people say, we will not have this man rule over us. And that's the hot heart of it. Look at what he says in Psalm chapter 2 and verse 3. Let us break their bonds in pieces, cast away their cords from us. In other words, we don't want to be attached to God. We don't want God to reign over us. We don't want Him over us anymore. And so we see that whole spirit in the world. And how does that manifest? Well, it manifests in persecution. And in Acts chapter 4, not only have they had the great experience of the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in chapter 3, but then there's a mighty miracle, chapter 2 rather, but then there's a mighty miracle in chapter 3. A man gets healed, and by this time there's probably a few thousand people have been born again in Jerusalem in just a very few short days. And the religious authorities start a persecution against the church. And when they had been released from this council, threatening them, warning them, it says, and I'll read for you, they came back together in verse 23 of Acts 4, and being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all the chief priests and elders said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, why did the nations rage? And the people plot vain things. The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they assembled together was all shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness, with great power. The apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace is upon them all. Here's what happened. They started getting persecuted. See, the nation started raging. We're not going to have this man rule over us. We don't want this Jesus. And so they unleash a persecution. But they just go right to the scripture and begin to pray. And they pray according to the scripture. They could see the fulfillment of Psalm chapter 2 in the persecution that was coming against them. And that made them realize, wait a minute, they're not just persecuting us. They're against God. And God, you're the creator. You made it all. And what was the result? They didn't pray for an escape. They said, Lord, give us more boldness. Give us more power. So I'm going to ask Wayne to lead us in prayer in a moment that, that in this day right here in America and all throughout the world, if you're watching us somewhere else, that despite all that's going on in the world that is anti-God and anti-Jesus and anti-Christian, that rather than cowering in fear, we would go to the Lord with bold prayer and say, Lord, pour out your spirit again. Stretch out your hand to heal. See, it was a miracle that got them into trouble. So what did they do? They asked for more miracles. And God filled it with the Holy Spirit and power. After, after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power to be my witnesses, Acts 1.8. So that's what we're going to pray for. We are living right now in an anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-Christian culture. What are we going to do? We're going to, we're going to appeal to God for more power, for more boldness, for more miracles, that He would truly be glorified. So let's pray about that right now. Let's, would you lead us in prayer? Thank you, Lord God. But God, God can. He can do above anything we can ask or think or imagine. So, Lord, we ask you for more miracles. We ask you, Lord, for more strength. We ask you, Father God, for more boldness. Lord, and we ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit, yes, Lord God, Lord. with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Yes, Lord, Father, Lord. I pray we would look at your scripture in the book of Acts, God, that we would study it, Father, and that we would ask you and that you would fill us with our prayer language, Father, wherever we're at, Lord Jesus, that you would just fill each one of us with that prayer language and that we would pray with boldness. And we thank you for it, God, that you sustain us, you keep us, and you give us that power and the boldness and the peace in Jesus' name. Before we sing again, let's, let's do something else, too. Let's be specific like they were here. They asked the Lord for miracles of healing. Did you see that? By stretching forth your hand to heal. And let's ask the Lord to do it. Is somebody persecuting you? Let's pray that there will be a miracle of healing somewhere close to them or even in them. 
In this culture of anti-God, anti-Christ, where the heathen are raging against the Lord and against his anointed, then let's see the anointed one, Jesus, do his miracles. Right now, would you just start praying for somebody you know that needs healing? Pray specifically for somebody you know that needs healing. So specific. Name them right now. Lord, heal Jeannie. Whoever else you're praying for, name them right now. Healing. Stretch out your hand to heal, Lord. In response to the world's persecution, more miracles. Yes, Lord. And now let's pray in general. Lord, do just a wave of healing throughout our church, throughout this Coachella Valley. Wherever people are listening, let there be a wave of healing. Thank you, Jesus. Supernatural healing you. that even the heathen cannot deny. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's worship, and then we'll get into the next section of this great song. awesome by doing miracles of healing and now here's the next section and that's verses 4 through 6 and I've simply entitled this the laughter of God the laughter of God they're threatening God and he laughs at them as if who do you think you are to threaten me I'm the creator of the heaven and the earth and you're threatening me notice what it says in verse 4 he who sits in the heaven sees not God's not panicking he's still sitting on his throne he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. See, the world says we will not have this man reign over us. And God says, I've set my king on his holy hill. I've set him there. He's king. Whether you acknowledge it or like it or not, he's king. Jesus is king. Well, look at the laughter of God. Psalm 37, 13, when the wicked are plotting against the just, it says the Lord laughs at him for he sees his day coming. In Psalm 59, it says uh, they with their mouth, they, they are like swords deep within their lips. And, and they say, who hears? In other words, we're going to get away with this. But you, O Lord, shall laugh at them. You shall have all the nations in derision. And the Bible says the day's coming, my friend. When the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his anointed one and of his Christ. So right now the world might be laughing uh, and making fun of Christians. But guess what? The Lord sits in heaven laughing at them. It's so foolish that they think they can overthrow God. Why do the heathen rage? Because they don't want Jesus reigning over them. Why does God laugh? Because Jesus is the king. And no matter what the world does, Jesus will always be the king. Psalm 29.10, it says this, God sits on the throne over the flood. God sits enthroned as king forever. You might feel like there's just a flood of stuff going on. The disruption in the world, the violence in the world, all that's going on in our culture. But the Lord is enthroned above the flood. And he sits enthroned as the king forever. Many, many years ago, there was an a, a emperor named uh, Diocletian, and uh, he was a pretty arrogant man. He had a metal uh, coin to himself, and he built two big monuments to himself. And on the metal and on both the monuments, he, was, he, he reigned from 245 to uh, 313 AD. But on those two monuments and on that metal, he wrote, one of the great accomplishments was, he says, Christianity under me is being extinguished. Well, let me ask you this. Where's Diocletian today? 
And where's Christianity today? At one point, even though we're not Catholic, at one point the very place where Diocletian was reigning from became the center of the largest denomination in the world. So Diocletian, God was laughing at that decree that you've extinguished Christianity. That which is of God can never be put out, my friend. So the heathen will rage and they'll imagine a vain thing. They're thinking something that's just empty. They cannot overthrow God. Don't you ever forget that. They cannot overthrow God. So the one who sits in the heavens is, is literally laughing at them. And now the next section is we see the reign of Messiah. But before we do that, let's sing again. Because I want us to get ready to celebrate the reign of Messiah. The world's not going to win. The Lord's laughing at, at the, the schemes and the vain plans of the world. His, he set his king on his holy hill. Jesus is king. That's a fact. No matter what else happens in the world, he's still king. And we're going to look at the reign of Messiah in just a moment. But let's worship him. You missionaries for a moment and in a moment uh, Lorraine would you read for us verses 7 8 and 9 and this section is what I call the reign of Messiah God set his king on his holy hill now what is Messiah going to be doing what is his reign verses 7 8 and 9 I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me you are my son today I have begotten you Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Well, this passage was quoted by Paul in Acts 13.33 about the resurrection of Jesus. You see, when God raised Jesus from the dead, the battle was won right there. In Revelation chapter 12, there's a vision of a woman who's about to give birth to a man-child and it quotes this psalm because the man-child who would be born of this woman in the vision would rule the nations with a rod of iron and so the devil was trying to devour him before he could come and rule it goes right along with why are the nations raging and and and, and wanting to rebel against the authority of God but see Jesus has been born and Jesus has died on the cross for our sins. And God has raised him from the dead. And that fulfills this passage. Today I've begotten you. Today you're my son. That's a reference to the resurrection of Jesus. But then he says to the Messiah in verse 8, Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. And the reason we're sitting here, I wanted you to see the mission board again. We have people that are going out in mission to win the nations for Christ. In India, where many haven't heard, in parts of Tanzania with the Rasmussen's, where many still have not heard, in Brazil, up in northern Brazil, where many still haven't heard, in Israel, where they still have so many right there in the Holy Land that don't know Jesus. We have these missionaries, many other places as well, and they're asking the Lord to give them the nations. Lord, we want to see the nations come to your son, Jesus. And so I'm going to ask, Glenn, would you just pray for missions? Just lead us in prayer for missions, and we'll finish up this, this passage here of 
before we end with the last section. Just let's pray for missions now. Jesus, Lord, we pray for missionaries, Father. We pray for the mission field. We pray for those people who haven't heard your word, Lord God, that you will put it in their hearts, Lord God, that when the missionary comes, that they will receive your word, Father. Lord, let, them, let us send out more missionaries, Father. Let the word go forth in power and in might, Lord God. Just, just all over the world, Lord God, we just pray that each person who has not heard of you will hear of you. And we thank you for that, Lord God, that you said in your word the nations would hear of you. So, Lord, open their ears and open their hearts and give them the hunger to find you. And we thank you, Father, that we have opportunity to send uh, missionaries and that we can help missionaries. And we just thank you, Lord. We thank you and we praise you. Praise Amen. You, you know, there's another great promise tied in with this verse, and that is that uh, in the last days, God is going to have people who will be overcomers. And, and Jesus said, if you overcome as I have overcome, you're going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Now, he's going to share his eternal rulership with those believers who overcome. So maybe right now, that's Revelation chapter 2, verse 27. So maybe right now you're struggling with something. Why don't you just thank him by faith? Say, Lord, I know I'm going through something. But by faith, I'm thanking you that I'm an overcomer. That you're getting ready for me to reign and rule with Messiah forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We will reign and rule with you according to your word. Now we're going to sing again in a moment, but notice this last part of the psalm has to do with, in one way, another chance for the nations to repent, but, but it also has to do with a personal worship and a personal relationship with the Lord. Verse 10, Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. So our worship should be an awe and a reverence and a fear of God, but also rejoicing. And then it ends with this verse 12, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in you. Well, let me give you a good definition of worship. And we see it expressed here, but... In ancient times, to kiss wasn't. Oftentimes, you'd kiss royalty, you'd kiss their hand, or. Uh, but it was it was also a, a sign of subjugation that I'm submitting myself to you. But worship in the old covenant and the new is a combination of these two things: awe and intimacy. We are awed by God, so He says, "Fear the Lord," and and, and serve Him with fear. But it also says, "Rejoice and kiss Him." So there's a sense of awe, and there's a sense of intimacy. And that's true worship. When you have those two things at the same time, you are awed by God, how majestic, how great He is, and yet you feel intimate with Him, and you express that. That's worship. In Luke chapter 7, it's like that lady that came, and she was kissing His feet and washing His feet. She was so grateful for forgiveness. Oh, she knew He was Lord, Messiah. She was awed by Him, but oh, how intimate and close she felt to Him. And I hope you will experience that today, too, that... You'll be in awe of God, as we sang, how awesome He is, but you'll be intimate with God. See, the nations are raging. They don't want His authority. But if you'll submit to His authority, you'll realize how beautiful He is, how wonderful He is. And so we want to worship again, and then I'll have Lorraine close us in prayer, but I want this to be a time where you just worship the Lord and say, Lord, teach me your fear. I want to be more a person of worship. And, I want to kiss the sun. I want, to, I want to have that submission and yet intimacy with Him. So let's just worship Him as we think of the words of this psalm and your personal relationship of worship with the Lord.
Jesus Christ returns, the kings of this earth will run to the caves and say, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. And he will smash the nations like a potter's vessel. But on that same day, we'll say, hallelujah, for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. You see, those who are submitting to his authority and are worshiping now, the coming of the Lord will be our great wedding ceremony. But those who reject him, it'll be a day of wrath. So I'm going to ask Wayne to close us in prayer, and then maybe we could go out with repeating that chorus, Nicole. And Would you just ask the Lord, draw you near? I want to be a person of worship. I want to be a person who's confident, not afraid of what's going on in the world because of this psalm. The Lord is still on the throne. Jesus is still king. And all the threats of the heathen, he laughs at. He's in control. He's going to reign and rule, and we're going to reign and rule with him, and he'll help you overcome now in the meantime. Lorraine, would you lead us in prayer? Thank you, Lord God. God, give us the boldness. Fill us afresh and anew with your Holy Spirit. Fill those with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues if they haven't had it or received it, that they'd see it in your word, that they would desire it, and that they would acknowledge that you can fill them, Lord. Let us pray in our prayer language for boldness, Father, and for wisdom, and God, that we could go out through all the nations and see people saved. I pray even in our hometown, next door, across the street, the next town, God, that we would be able to touch our neighbors and our friends and our acquaintances. Lord God, that you would give us boldness and fresh ideas ideas on how, how to reach people for you. Lord, and around the world, those people that we know through through all this internet, Lord God, that you would use it, that you would use it for good. And we thank you, Father, that we desire more of you and your kingdom to come, Father. And we know that we know that we know that we will be with you one day. And we thank you for that, Father. And we just praise you and we desire to see more in your kingdom. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. You know, if the Lord's laughing, it's okay for you to laugh every now and then, too. Just lighten up and know that He's King. It's going to be all right. As we just worship our way out, we'll let the time expire. and Let's just worship as, as we're ending this. Show.